All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Emmanuel Sovich, and uh, I'm your, your host today. Uh, I'm a classical guitarist, and it's been what feels like a couple of months since the last time I've, I've had the pleasure of, of being with you here in Tombe. So it's, it's very, very good to be back. And of course, if you are here today, it's actually probably not me who you're here to see, but Alexander Whittingham, the amazing Alexander Whittingham, who will be sharing with us on Francisco Tarrega's Capricho Arabe, that quintessential piece of romanticism, which we've all, I hope we've all heard. And if not, you will discover it today with, with Alex. So um, chances are that if you are here for Alex, you know her from some of her wonderful YouTube videos. He, she's, uh, aside from being an amazing guitarist, she's also um, someone who has, you know, a, a very, um, very wonderful YouTube channel. Uh, it's, it, I think it has something like over 13 million views or something ridiculous like that, which just comes to show how, um, how much her music resonates with, with the audience. So it's, it's very, uh, very joyful for us to, to host her here uh, at Tombase. And not least, I had, you know, the, 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 the great pleasure of studying alongside Alexander Whittingham in London. We had uh, many burgers, meals, and and kind of hang out occasionally, and uh, I got to we got to hear each other play while we studied. So it's it's really nice to get to come back together for just a little bit here. And uh, I really don't have much more to say to to introduce her. If you haven't checked out her videos, do make sure to do that right after you watch this live stream. But otherwise, I will just welcome Alexandra onto the screen. Let's see if I can get this right. There we go. Welcome, Alex. It's Hello. it's great to have you here in Tone Base, and thank you so much for. Uh, bringing your, you know, your your expertise and your uh, your secrets, hopefully, uh, about Francisco Tarragas Capricho Arabe. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's um, it's really nice to be back. Uh, yeah, I've only done one like live stream before with Tone Base, and it was more of a talking one. So everybody's probably sick of my voice already. But <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's it's true. Absolutely sick of your voice, uh, but not of your guitar playing. So. <laughs> Well, there we go. I'm going to try and do it. My nails are absolutely like shot to bits uh, at the moment. So you have to forgive any playing that I, uh, that I do. But um, I yeah, manage. when you kind of asked what piece I wanted to do, I mean, this is kind of the same reaction that people get when you say, oh, can you play me something? And it's always the same piece because I just, I don't know, like, I don't think I'll ever fall out of love with this piece. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's like the same for a lot of people when it's probably one of those pieces that when you first start playing the guitar, you want to play it from the get go. And then when you do finally get to play it, it's like, oh, it's amazing. I'm playing this piece. And that feeling hasn't really like gone away for me. I just love it. It's such, like you said, it's such a, a lovely um, romantic piece. And yeah, it's just fantastic. So thank you for letting me share my love for Capriccio Arabe. <laughs> Oh, pleasure. Uh, I mean, before we get into the piece, uh, maybe in, in the off chance that a few members of the audience don't know uh, you, can you just tell us like in, in 20 seconds or a few phrases, like how did you get started with the guitar? Was, you know, Tarrega, any, you know, music that you heard which kind of got you hooked? Yeah, I think um, I originally started by playing a lot of, uh, I played acoustic guitar, electric guitar, mm. a lot of rock songs, pop songs, more, more, mainly like Green Day and Avril Lavigne type things. And then uh, one day, it, it sounds like such a cliche story, but it, it's true, I promise. Um, I kind of walked into my guitar lesson and my guitar teacher was sat playing a Spanish piece and I can't for the life of me remember what that piece was. It, I think it was some kind of like Fandango dance kind of thing. But, um, and from the moment I heard that, um, he was playing a nylon string and I'd never, I don't think really played a nylon string before. Mm. And instantly I wanted to learn that. And um, the pieces that I then began listening to were sort of like Capriccio Arabe, obviously Asturias, Recuerdos, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're definitely the main three that really, really just made me want to learn the guitar. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it was probably a few years. It took, definitely took a few years before I did uh, learn any of those pieces. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very cool. So, <laughs> so as you say, like these piece, this piece together with things like like Words of the Alhambra or Asturias are perhaps one of the first things that listeners, that you know, aspiring guitarists or amateur guitarists might come across and and fall in love with. Um, so it's very easy to kind of identify or have a relationship with these pieces in that sense. But um, can you tell us a little bit of you know who, who's Tarrega? Where does he fall within our guitar literature? Like, and where does 
this piece in particular fall within his repertoire or what does it mean to you if you, if you can like just give us a little bit of a background yeah um well i actually uh did a lot of well recently have done a lot of playing of 19th century music mm. um and obviously tarragon is a big big part of that uh i released my debut album last year which is all 19th century european composers so there was a lot of tarragon to choose from <laughs> Um, and I did try my best to kind of uh, source material from elsewhere. And I think there were nine different countries uh, composer wise that, that I wow. covered within that. Um, but it was kind of a no brainer to include this piece. I also included um, Requeros, but they were kind of, they feel very natural to put together um, mm -hmm. because I get, I think the kind of the sentiment comes from this, a very similar place with them. Uh, I mean, obviously this is like an Arabic caprice. Mm -hmm. um, it was composed after a trip that um, that Tarraga made to Granada, which, you know, with the Alhambra being there, there's that significance as well. And I think Requeros came uh, a few years later, maybe 10 or so years later, I'm not quite sure. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it felt quite natural to pair them together. And I think they really work as a pairing in concerts and things like that. And um, yeah, it's I think it's a really kind of, it's a good standalone piece as well, I think, to put into a program. It's mm -hmm. a good encore, it's a good standalone, it's a good sort of like, to put into a set of three, a set of two, it just works. It's just the perfect piece. <laughs> Amazing. And remind us, Alex, do you have a video of this on your channel? Yes, from a long time ago, yeah. Okay, cool. So we have a video and it's on your debut album. Is that My European Journey? It is, yes. Okay, which is available on Spotify, I think, or even better, people can maybe buy a copy on Amazon or something? Yes. I believe so. <laughs> it's available yeah. everywhere you listen to music. I believe it's available there. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, well, now you know. So after this live stream, you go watch uh, Alexander's YouTube channel. <laughs> you go watch the video and you buy the album. Okay. Um, awesome. Go. So <laughs> all sorted. Now, uh, Alex did not pay me anything for this, I promise. So uh, <laughs> she has no, no role to play in this. Uh, but with that plug, I think we just want to maybe dive into it because it's it's a yes. piece which has lots of corners where you know we're, we'll be eager to know how you sort out some of these things and we only have about 45 minutes and I do want to encourage everyone to start thinking while we're presenting the piece while Alex is presenting Capricharave if you have any questions or anything you'd like to put to her comments uh, by all means write it in the chat but even better there's also a, a colored button I understand it's a red button sometimes it changes color um, Barney already sent in a question. So at the end of the session, we are going to try to dedicate at least, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to answering your questions. So make sure you do that. If you're on YouTube, unfortunately, we, we might not have time to source the YouTube questions, but if you were to head over to the Tone Base website and uh, find the stream there, you would be able to submit your questions. So uh, with that, I think I might just leave Alexandra on screen for a while and let her tell us a bit about about this music i might pretend i'm an audience member and just scribble on a score which i will have on the screen as well so forgive me if the scribbles don't seem to make sense i'll try my best to reflect what alex is is talking about but um, <laughs> but yeah again feel free to comment make sure to submit your questions and over to you alex awesome thank you very much okay so i'm gonna try and stop fangirling about this piece um <laughs> It is genuinely one of my favourite pieces. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm commentating on that. Um, cool. So I'm not um, going to go through kind of bar by bar or like every single kind of fingering aspect or anything like that. I, I will try to, I've been told I speak very quickly, so I am going to try to slow down. Um, but I'm, I'd like to talk about this piece in a more, uh, thinking about it more as a whole, um, and also sort of covering some of the technical aspects that are kind of required for certain parts of it, speaking a lot about the musical side of things, how you might be able to interpret it in different ways. Um, because personally, that's why I still play this piece. I think I played it for so long, um, very much on and off, you know, I'll have, I won't include it in every single concert I do, but you know, um, definitely a good proportion of them if it works within the program. And I think the reason that it hasn't got boring is because my interpretation has changed over time. 
and that's when when Manny uh, mentioned my video, uh, which was probably about six or seven years ago now. I'm going to say six because it definitely doesn't feel like seven. But uh, I've watched that back. Well, not very often, but I have watched it back and kind of go, oh, I wouldn't do it like that now. Like it's very I don't like the sound I'm making or I don't like that. The sort of rubato that I used. And so that's why I kind of. Uh, took the opportunity and ran with it to record it on my album last year because I felt like I wanted to sort of to put out a fresh interpretation of the same piece so I think that's a really nice thing to do from time to time so if you already play this piece then hopefully you might get some new ideas or um, if not then do submit a question <laughs> okay so as you probably know we're down to D we're tuned down to D uh, and we have this like lovely expansive opening which I absolutely love purely because as soon as that's over, we have this bass line of and it just becomes very structured all of a sudden. So this is, uh, it's just expansive and I think it has to feel like that. So the harmonics that we have at the beginning of the seventh fret, I think my first ever guitar teacher when I was learning this um, would shoot out of her seat I've got this image of her shooting out of her seat and kind of dancing around the room. And honest to God, that is what I think of every single time I play those harmonics. <laughs> and it kind of helps because honestly, like it, it kind of, um, I think you need to move your hand. You need that kind of action. If you do, for some reason, it just does not have the same effect. You want the harmonics to feel like they're bursting out of something. Do you see what I mean? It, it kind of has to feel very, just, it's just a very good opening to a piece. So, and then that gives you loads of time to get all the way up here. Which does not have to be too fast, I think, you know, it's, we can save the fastness for later on. So. It's important to count here as well. <laughs> um, as much as this, the run doesn't have to be too fast. I think when we get to, And then we can take another breath before we go into the next repeat. Roll. So these two uh, obviously happens twice. The first time I think it's nice to do it straight. So we don't roll the chord, we just do it straight. And then the second time, it's more of a closing statement of that, of that little bit. So you can hang on to the D a little bit longer. And it just feels a little bit more like you've just sort of uh, finished it and you can kind of take a little bit of a breath after that. So in general, for those, um, I mean, it's kind of those two lines really, isn't it? But uh, it's really, really important to get the slurs on here to be able to have a wrist which is quite straight, purely because if we're like this and we're pulling the finger, the, the pinky back this way, you get much less of a sound than there. So it's really, really important to be aware of the fact that you wanna pull down instead of upwards here. So, so your thumb is resting here. And then when we slide back, the thumb comes up a little bit so that we're not on here anymore. We come up and it's in the middle uh, of the neck at the back. So you have a straight wrist here, the wrist comes out and that's how we move down the fretboard. And it's really important because if we're still like this, when we get here, the fourth finger, you can see how much it has to stretch to get to this note. And that's in position. Whereas if the hand comes like this and curves around, your fourth finger, and your second finger, which are <clears throat> the fingers that are doing the slurs, get to pull down into the hand and not backwards like this so that they actually make that solid slur noise and you can get a really, really good sound. Some people do slow there, some people don't. Uh, cool, okay. Next bit, probably, 
I think maybe everyone's favorite bit or my, no, maybe my favorite bit. <laughs> but you get this big uh, melody of the bass. So. opinion I really 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 think that this just should not feel rushed at all it, it, I think it's the most important um well not the most important but I, I just think it's really really important that it doesn't feel it just there are lots of notes on the page and it's really easy for the brain to go oh my gosh that's a lot of notes that's a lot of notes whereas if you think about it structurally and how you want to phrase it, it wait, it just makes a lot more sense. Um, so when we get to here, so. I think this, you can't, you kind of got to the top of the mountain, you're having a look at the view, you take a big breath and then you go down. <laughs> um, you know, you don't want to, uh, it just, you want to savor that moment, I think, when you get there. there. There are a lot of moments within this piece that warrant savoring, in my opinion. So now, fingering wise, one option, obviously, I think that is in, um, I believe I'm using the same score as on Tobe, so <clears throat> mm -hmm. probably better than my fingering, to be honest. But for the purposes of this, we will use the fingering here. So for land on the one on the C sharp in that next bar. So what I like to do is accent and kind of uh, give more space to the first note of each of these groups. So the C sharp, you've landed on the A, give that a little bit more space and then, uh, sorry. the E. So it's almost like highlighting the C sharp, the A and the E. And when you put it all together, um, probably can't do that speed, but if you don't do it like that, it, it just doesn't really sound like it's going anywhere. Whereas if you hit that E, and obviously this group of notes that um, that come after the E, is, uh, they're faster. So if you hit the E, it's much easier for you to hear, okay, that's, that's where we kind of delve into the faster notes. Whereas if nothing is accented or you don't have a kind of placeholder for that, um, the phrase is kind of lost. And also I think, well, I would be kind of lost as well if, if everything was, if, if there were no accents or no kind of phrasing within that. So we've had definitely a note to savor. So that's uh, that's really cool because uh, <laughs> you, you talked about how you know it's well it's it's in the page it looks like the busiest section, but you said it should feel you know kind of not very busy at all. And the mental approach you seem to be taking is subdividing this very large chunk of many notes into smaller units so to kind of put signposts or, yeah. or, or something like that to, to kind of hang on to and you kind of just break one huge scale into smaller units which are very much you know more doable or, or kind of easier is, is that kind of the way you think about yeah. it or is, is there a different approach definitely no it, it makes it um it makes it much more manageable hmm. and i mean that's kind of how i work with pieces like in general anyways just definitely splitting them up into smaller sections because when you look at things as a whole and just read through it and then go okay I'll read through it again and again and it's just not personally it's just, I find that it's just not a, a good way of, of learning and things just creep in whereas if you're able to take smaller sections it's so much easier. Um, could you remind us like what the exact subdivision is like uh, what what are your groups in this scale like how do you think about it? So with the way that they're grouped on the page is mm -hmm. how I usually um, <clears throat> work through that. So that C 
sharp for me is the um, is the start. It's almost it almost feels like when you drop a ping pong ball and it's going da, 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 and it's just getting a little bit faster every time. That's mm -hmm. how I kind of think of those notes that start those phrases. Um, so it's a C sharp, the A, and then that E. At the so end. would you think of the A as the last note of like closing the previous group of notes or as the first one of the next? That's a good question, actually. <laughs> I think almost, yeah, almost a bit of both, but mainly the last of the, um, the last of the, well, of the run down to it, I guess. Gotcha. Because I think it's less of an accent and more, more of a separation. I think the E is definitely an accent because that isn't um, with the way that the notes lie. For yeah. instance, with the, with the C sharp and the A, obviously the A is the end of that run and then we go back up to a C natural. Mm -hmm. But then from the C natural, it's all the way down um, to the bottom E. Whoops. Gotcha. <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, I think accenting that, that, um, that is definitely, I think it would benefit from an accent just because it, it separates that whole run um, and also technically on the page, it is faster as well from that point. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. I've scribbled that on the score. So I'll, I'll let you continue. Cool. <laughs> so we're done with, we're done with the, this wonderful atmospheric introduction. Uh, and after this, uh, well, the B flat, I, I always find that B flat to be one of my favorite notes in this piece. It's like, it has just so much in it resolving to the A and finally resolving one more time to the yeah. D, which is, the beginning of something new. Like, it, I, I love that when you have so, so much suspense concentrated in something and suddenly it mm. just kind of releases. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a, there, there's a lot in that B flat. <laughs> um, and I think it's really easy to overdo as well, mainly with vibrato. So I think it's obviously when you tune down to D and it's on the sixth string, you literally have to move your hand the slightest bit and it just, like, the sound just wobbles. So doesn't really need like a really wide you know I think um I definitely learned that the hard way and I was like oh my gosh that sounds that sounds ridiculous um better to do too much than too little maybe I don't know <laughs> oh yeah I mean the amount of vibrato I use is ludicrous so I shouldn't be giving advice on this but <laughs> I li it's literally like the slightest and I, I never I never go like half with vibrato I always go way over so I think that's a really nice note as well but anyway yeah they should all be nice they should all be nice and then the like the deepest sound on that that d so the bass line there is um is definitely the thing that you want to stand out like manny just said that's like the the start of this this um well, it's basically at the start of the piece, really, the start of the theme that we all know. Um, and we're introduced to the bass line before introduced to the melody. So if you can get the... Before we get to the melody, then you've set, you've, you've set it up really well. So, personally, well, I don't do the slide at the beginning, but it's there, so by all means. <laughs> I actually save the... I save the slide from the F to the A uh, for the very last time that it happens uh, at the very end of the piece. But if you want to do it every time, do it every time. It's it's one of those pieces. It's like it's got everything in there, and you can kind of, you know. Um, but yeah, so we have the melody. So the second A obviously is the one that you want to accent. It's very easy to want to go. And it's just not as, it doesn't have the same effect. Whereas if you can um, ever so slightly, because then that F underneath the A resolves to the E. So when you accent that, there. One thing to note on the trill, um, 
just a very quick note to bear in mind that the it's the B flat that um, you want a lot more of than the A. So it's very, it can be sometimes quite easy to make it into a bit of a triplet or, and it has a completely different meaning. It's, it, you know, it completely kind of sets it apart. Whereas the trill is really there to basically accent the, the B flat really. You know, you can easily do it and take it out, but you just want the, so the better pull off you can get with your trill, the better it'll sound. Mm -hmm. uh, cool, let's go on. So. Obviously we want a little bit of a crescendo going up to here. I don't usually do the slur there, but by all means, please do. Uh, there are a few, few slurs that I've omitted uh, in my, my recording and that I do in uh, when I play it live too. But it's important to note that um, if you do ever like take out slurs, it's always really important to try to at least mimic the effect of the slur. So for example, if I'm gonna take out this slur, I wouldn't play, you know, because the slur obviously is gonna mean that the, the second note, so in this case our E, is gonna be ever so slightly quieter because it's, it's kind of, you're leaning on the F. <laughs> So if you're not going to do the slur, then it's just kind of nice to uh, to make it a little bit more balanced, as it would sound like with the slur. Um, so same here. That's a very difficult slur. So you actually go for three four instead of two four. I do. I find three four weirdly easier. Yeah. So yeah, for different people, like they'll be able to stretch more between one and two or between three and four. I think I'm one and two because I have a weird pinky. It's kind of it's shaped weirdly, but obviously <laughs> there'll be. I think there'll be people in both camps uh, in the audience. So Definitely. there you go. If if it's yes. useful for you. No, um, that's a, that's good to point out actually. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, I've got a, like a huge gap, like a huge span between my pinky and my third finger. So. And do you, do you slur it as well? Um, not usually. I mean, it is possible, but you can. Obviously, but... That's impressive. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Alex. I'm jealous now. Okay. <laughs> Keep on going. I'll just no, but I take the easy way out. <laughs> no, I take the easy way out. I'm just lazy. <laughs> but I do try my best. If I don't slur it, I do try my best to. So like the, the E is obviously yeah. a lot quieter. I think this B flat here as well. I don't know, everything deserves vibrato in this piece, but I love to give that a bit of vibrato. And then that's the kind of the, uh, that E flat there, you kind of, on top of the mountain again, looking at the view, and then we kind of go back. Um, cool, the melody before that, obviously very, very uh, similar in respect to the fact that the second A is accented again. I think there's a lot of weight to that F sharp. So just bear that in mind. I, don't, I think it's quite a shame sometimes to just bypass it. do stop the bass there but that's not in the music but I think it just deserves some prominence so that's why I do it but... oops obviously vibrato on that goes without saying uh, <laughs> hold it hold it hold it hold it and then um yeah so obviously same with that slur as well it's uh, the C, but it's obviously been accented there. So both resolutions. So with this, 
um, I think it's quite important to recognize that it's like very different to what we get at the very beginning. So obviously at the very beginning we get the, um, which is repeated in some respects within mm -hmm. this big run that we have here. Um, I think it's quite, uh, well, it, it's easy to want to play it at the very beginning really fast because that's how it kind of feels like it should be later on because we've got the achel and it's a lot longer. Um, whereas personally, I think that when we hear it at the beginning, it should, it should be more poised. We've not built up to anything like musically yet. Whereas when we get here, um, we do build up to it. We start at the B flat. We don't just start right high up. We start here. And then by the time we're here, it's we've built up enough to warrant that not sounding ridiculous. <laughs> Whereas if we went, you know, if we did like, you know, I mean, gosh, uh, <laughs> it would just sound ridiculous. So, it's nice to make uh, a little bit of the achal here. A vib on the top G as well, if you can. And then I tend to get faster from that point as opposed to a little bit before, but again, the achal is definitely is technically from before that, so. And then the last two, uh, sorry, the last, the last beat of that bar. We've got tenuto on the uh, the D. So it's that whole range of contrast that you get within that two bars. So and then you feel like you've earned the D by the end of it. You've earned the you've earned that resolution yeah. of you deserve an open string. Exactly, yeah. You yeah. can kind of give your hand a rest for the quaver. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So then obviously we have a complete repeat of that. The technical aspects obviously don't need going over from that. But um, but yes, all I will say is that very nice to have a different colour uh, mm -hmm. on that. So I tend to start that maybe like semi-ponticello, um, just so it's a little bit different. So we get a bit more of a... <laughs> bit more of like a crisp sound. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously all of that is exactly the same until we get to here. So these cute little chords and then, and I think this is the bit that everybody dreads because it's like taxing on the left hand. Um, but the only thing I really wanted to say about this section is that a lot of the time it's quite easy for the melody to get lost uh, because it's kind of within that, uh, within the range, well, in the range that it is within, sorry, uh, so that you have your bass line, but then the accompaniment is uh, range-wise on top of the melody. So we have as our sort of bass and accompaniment, and then the melody sits, you know, so it kind of is quite easy for it to get lost within that. So personally, right hand wise, I think it's always good to try and get a rest stroke on the at least the first one, both, you know, both of you can, so that you, th those two C's really stand out. Um, this, there's not really any way around, it's just difficult. <laughs> uh, there we go. Uh, again, same with that, that E. It's not an easy, uh, it's not an easy trill, but... So what's the key element which helps you play that trill effectively? Does that have to do with doing anything special with the third finger maybe? Or I remember like struggling with, with three, four slurs and wondering like what on earth could make it work? I think there, hmm. um, the, the, I think what makes it difficult is the fact that you've got so much weight with the bar eight anyway, that hmm. it's difficult for the second string not to be pulled down too close to the first. So mm. at least that's what I find anyway. So that by the time I get to the trill, mm -hmm. if it's too, th there's nowhere for you to, to pull downwards yeah. to. Whereas I think um, one of the most useful things that, that uh, I think uh, Michael, when we were studying, 
uh, told me, which has literally stuck with me every single time I'm doing a barre that hurts. I'm like, think of what he said, think of what he said, which was, if you think about how uh, small your muscles are in your hand compared to sort of the muscles that you have up here, you know, make them work with each other so that you're not always squeezing the fretboard, which means mm. that your fingers are going to be, be uh, making the strings sort of go down into themselves. Mm. Bring it, make it so that you kind of have a, a little bit of obviously using these muscles to get that sound, but uh, they're supported by this muscle here, which is literally bringing the guitar closer to you. And the more of this muscle that you use, the more that kind of counteracts the downward motion of squeezing with your hand. So it kind of brings the guitar like into you a lot more <laughs> as opposed to being weighed down this way. Um, and that is, in, that's literally, I found that so incredibly useful um, technique wise. And this is a good place to kind of apply that, I think, because because that's not really an easy chord anyway, just to just to have on. But when you when you put in the trill, you need the you need um, the amount of space sort of here on the fret that yeah. that you would have if it was just an open string. You need that amount of space to be able to make that happen. So instead of burdening your hand with all the effort and kind of I don't know locking it or, or yeah, just overburden you kind of offload that to your arm a little bit and then if i understood yeah. correctly something to do with like making sure the second string stays in place instead of it kind of creeping towards the first string where you can no longer slur effectively definitely yeah so yeah, the main okay. idea the main idea is that instead of um i don't know if you can see maybe i do this a little bit but um mm -hmm. instead of doing this and as you can see maybe pulling this the uh, i mean pulling yeah. the second string downwards yeah. a little bit just to be able to get that force of the barre. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead, you're using this muscle here and just ever so slightly bringing that in into you. So like in the direction of your chest, so the guitar is a little bit more mm -hmm. uh, sort of like settled there. And all of a sudden you need to use less of these muscles that are, that are really kind of, you know, making you like tense mm -hmm. up and do this. Yeah, and it's much much easier for the string to just stay in the same place, and it's also more relaxed for your hand as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'd highly recommend uh, not squeezing the fretboard too much here, just yeah. because then it's, it makes the trill so difficult. <laughs> it's kind of a paradox, isn't it? That the things that are supposed to sound the most carefree, yeah. easy, and this is like for me the most serene section. It's like ah, you're just kind of having yeah. a walk in the park kind of thing. Except that technically, it's actually uh, the most demanding <laughs> like occasionally occasionally in music you have things which are rather easy but very effective like they sound very difficult and then you have things which sound very easy but actually are <laughs> very difficult which is my least favorite combination oh, uh, of course it doesn't sound difficult for you but uh so that's that's no, one like, God, that's <laughs> the same thoughts that I have every time I get there as well in a concert I'm like oh make it sound easy make it sound easy and then you get there and sometimes it's like <laughs> you know it's, it just sounds like a struggle so that's you know you definitely don't want it to sound like that um mm. but then you have to take advantage of the next bit so obviously this trill is a little bit easier Oops. this one and then that feels a little bit freer you can kind of I think it's very important um and I'm sure you do this too Manny when you're playing concerts and things that you look for the um I mean in practice you look for the for the places that you could just kind of breathe a little bit more and literally allow like the air to kind of go to your muscles and like relax them a little bit because I think when we're playing like uh when we're playing harder passages you forget to breathe and then you're all tensed up. And then when you come to something easier, it kind of just oh, just all does this. And so I think it's fine in the balance sometimes between those two things. I don't know, for me it is anyway. <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned Michael uh, before. And for those curious, uh, Alex was referring to our, our teacher at the World Academy of Music, Michael Lewin. I'm pretty sure he's not watching us. So uh, I don't think I'll embarrass him by saying we, I think we, we both enjoyed our, our time there. And he had lots of wisdom. One thing he mentioned uh, about the, the kind of open strings is that you could you know he's very methodic that you could like maybe write i don't know if it was a percentage or some kind of indication of how many like open strings the piece had so you could kind of plan your program 
depending on you know oh, that's how such a good idea. how severe it is. So you know, in, in an <laughs> ideal wor- world, I'd have a spreadsheet which says like seventy eight percent. Well, that's ridiculous. You won't have seventy eight percent open <laughs> strength. But let's say like five percent, which is very little, or like twenty percent, and then you make sure you you kind of vary them. Um, but so but you can I do that in a more intuitive way, I guess. Like if you know there's a piece which is super taxing, hopefully you won't put another one equally taxing right after it um or or you'll make sure to prepare a great deal if you do um yeah but yeah very cool okay so we we're kind of reaching yes i'll I'll do some more general uh some more general points about this because i could talk about this piece till the cars come home but um yes so obviously we here Oops. this is probably the most instru- interesting bit of this section as far as I'm concerned <laughs> um, I don't know whether I don't think I've heard anybody not play this pomp the... Oops. but it just works I think I don't know it just provides that contrast but anyway I really like but quiet obviously And then maybe a different color there, obviously because it's very similar to the last uh, the last bit. Um, so I think that's an interesting one finger wise. Um, so when we get to the the run up to this, so. So you slur all four notes together. Nice. Yeah. D- so I've never heard anybody not do that though. Is that mm-hmm. a? Uh... Uh, you're probably right. People I think. Do that differently. I'm just just looking at the score. It says three, like three one, but that makes total sense to slur all four. Oh, is in. I think my score says something different. Maybe then. Uh, there we go. Okay. Oh, yes. Sorry, I did used to play. I now know what you meant. Sorry. Um, sorry, I misunderstood. No, I think I did used to play. And then um, I think I listened to somebody else do it and I was like, oh, no, that sounds really cool. So you can go, uh, wait, that's messing with my brain now. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you can do it before, like, um, to land with the bass note, or hmm. there's my harmonic. Or I think it depends on the speed that you play the the mm-hmm. trill at, really. Um, if you can do it fast enough to make it feel like it's still on the first beat, then hmm. you know. Um, but yeah, I do like to slur all of those, but you have to be able to get a kind of good enough slur with the two one. Which, luckily enough, is the easiest finger. They're the easiest fingers to do it with, anyway. Um, so, the, not like that though. But to make the A stand out at the end, and then you can get uh, if you do it like that, the second and third fingers come over, and then you get the harmonic with the fourth, and then the nice bass note. Uh, so this bass note obviously starts the um, the next kind of section never had any of this material before of all of these arpeggios. Um, I like to split the arpeggios, the kind of, um, well, almost kind of repeat. We get this one twice. Oops. And then I like to go pianissimo, so subito. And almost grind to a halt there. Um, it's completely new material, so I think you can kind of present it in any which way you like, because it's not coming back either. <laughs> so we don't need to recognize it later on. Um, but it's quite dramatic, so. And then that last A there is the first of the next group of four. So obviously it's grouped as the first of the next group of four, but it's so easy to think of one, 
two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It's so easy to think within this scale, this chromatic scale that we now have, it's a little bit too easy to think of the, the first low A as the first of the group of four, and it isn't. You have to think of this as the first, and that's number two, because otherwise it gets so confusing the further through the scale you go. Um, yeah, so I think, and also it kind of helps you recognize when you get to the group of five at the end. Um, mm -hmm. And I quite like to make it evident that that's a group of five and not necessarily just get faster and faster. Um, mm -hmm. I know there are a few different ways of doing it. And I think, you know, it's, this definitely isn't the, the only way, but I think it kind of structurally, I just think it kind of works. So from there, whoops. Wise, I can, I, I, yeah, I'll go through it a little bit slower. But... I shift on the third string and then four. And I think, I don't know, I find that's the easiest fingering, at least for me, anyway. Um, and then we get this whole new kind of lease of life within the major section. So. These little connectors here, always a good excuse to have some vibrato on there. Um, I think this whole section, especially from the get go, um, I mean, there's such a big build up to it through the chromatic scale, but it has to feel like you've reached somewhere. So especially on the, oops. So, whoops. so you can hear the tiny little bit of time that I take on the first note of that section. So, whoops, a bit too much. And then that second A is still accented like we had in the minor as well. <clears throat> so just going on from there, um, all the way down to the first uh, of those kind of little transition-y bits. D sharp that comes out of nowhere. <laughs> so that needs to be heard. Whoops. Those slurs can be quite... Um... But as long as you've got the straight wrist. Sounds a bit like an electric guitar sweep. It does a bit, doesn't it, actually? It's like the it yellow bus etude yeah <laughs> also it's like i, I always imagine the electric guitar <laughs> but I, I like how you mentioned like emphasizing the d sharp which is like the, the the wrong notes or the you know the strange notes in the key the same thing you said maybe at the end of page one where we had the very first f sharp we've had in the entire piece so for the viewers i'm just showing it here uh mm. when you're in d minor mm. you have the f sharp which is a strange note going to you know g minor or whatever it is uh, the same thing here. You were in D major, so D sharp has nothing to do really uh, in D major. So it's it's kind of it, yeah valuable that you point out that these things, these dis dissonances, you know, harmonically are brought out to kind of emphasize the um, the discourse, whatever. <laughs> but... Yeah, I think it's really important. I mean, it. it... Um, it's a very accessible piece, isn't it? It's very yeah. uh, tonal, it's very this, it's very that, it's very romantic. And I think um, mm. what makes it romantic are those, is kind of those, um, is all of the contrast in it. <laughs> because there is so much contrast to it. There's a lot within a five minute piece. And I think that's what makes it um, such a good piece, a standalone piece as well. I think that's the same with a lot of the shorter pieces that do get played as standalone pieces, is that you feel like you've been taken somewhere uh, throughout it even though it's quite a short a relatively short space of time um so yeah always always room for a little bit of vib. <laughs> and again uh talking about vibrato so 
after this harmonic, I mean, it's just endless, but, um, so we have this, that open string then allows us to go down to the second uh, position. So, and in my opinion, this is one of the sweetest parts in the whole piece. Um, it depends how you play it, but personally, I just, just take so much time over it because <laughs> it's just so beautiful. There's not very many moments that we don't have to play the melody on the first string, um, you know, for this. So, Oops. I mean, yeah, it's just gorgeous. I just love that bit so much. Um, so I think when you're down here, obviously you can do a little bit more tasto with the right hand. And then when you shift, just try to compensate a little bit for that. So bring it down just a tad over the um, over the sound hole. So if anyone watching is a kind of beginner or an intermediate player, they might find it interesting to hear more about how like tasto isn't a fixed position of the right hand, like necessarily, but it varies yeah. depending on what on where you're playing. Like yeah definitely so to get, yeah so, so to get a similar color like maybe you want to demonstrate like just once more so so people understand like if you're playing in 12th position and you play literally on tasto like on the on the fretboard like it'll actually produce a brighter sound than closer to the sound hall yeah yeah exactly so if i'm playing with my right hand left right yeah if i'm playing <laughs> after all these years i still have to make sure it's left <laughs> Um, <laughs> good. <laughs> if I'm playing up here, so for example, like maybe where where the octave is, so obviously, mm. um, so if I'm playing very tasto here, and then come all the way to this B, you can hear how that has a very similar effect to. Yeah. It just sounds way more nasal, way brighter. Mm -hmm. So you have to compensate. Um, for the space between your hands, basically. Mm. Um, so if you're higher up the fret, then you just want to move your hand ever so slightly and you'll still get a sweet sound. I feel like you kind of slipped in a, a golden nugget in there. You said the like the place where the octave harmonic is and you produce like, what I would guess is like the sweetest sound you can produce on a string. Yes. Like Yeah, um, so if you play, um, I mean, for example, like this D for instance, if you find where that D would be after the 12th fret mm. and you find the, the artificial harmonic, if you pluck above where that artificial harmonic is, that is pretty oh, wow. much technically the sweetest sound yeah. that you can get out of that note um, because of, of where exactly where you're plucking. If you pluck either side, you'll get you'll literally get a different sound. It's weird. <laughs> Amazing. There you go. So that's the secret. If anyone's looking for the sweetest sound they can make. Um, there we that, go. There's the, uh, the thumbnail for you for the video. There How you to go. get yeah. the sweetest sound. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Okay, awesome. I won't well, this is definitely the place for the sweetest sound. No, no, no. It's, this is this is definitely the place for it. Um, so yeah, so we slide all the way up. It's difficult not to get a really harsh. Uh... And then we're back in. So obviously you've got the writ um, at those. here i don't know why i'm calling them connectors uh that's just a word that's popped into my head um but this that's the last one that we get there um so personally i like to milk it completely milk it um because we're not going to get one again and it's a really really nice little uh little kind of so if you're going to lean on any definitely the c sharp whoops so if I go from just a little bit before, yeah, that could be better. And it just makes it sound, I mean, if the audience hasn't heard this piece before, it makes it sound like you are gonna make your final statement. And I think that's always mm. quite nice to pace a piece like that. Um, so obviously then we back into, big 
moment, isn't it? Of where we have to hold, look at the view again. Um, important that that note, I mean, on the page, you know, you've got the pause above it. It's, it's, it's built too. So you have the... So naturally you might think, oh, that's got to be really loud. It's got to build up to... Whereas in fact, you probably heard that and went, oh. Um, and usually, you know, sometimes you do build to, to chords and notes and you play them and they're loud and everything else builds up to that. But in this instance, a lot of the time when you go higher, especially like the 12th fret and above, it's so nice to kind of build to it, but have the build, the, have the build up more relating to like the kind of sound that you have on that note as opposed to the, the volume of that note. So it's, I think it's more about the weight of that with the rest. So it's more about the sound and more about the the way that you treat it, I think, isn't it? The the room that you give it. And then I have a, a friend who's a pianist and he he's very theoretical about like performance, which is uh, very enlightening occasionally. And he's talked about to me about how if you have like um, a certain dynamic range, you know, level Obviously, if this is your range and you play a note way up here, you know, an accent, that is highlighted. But by the same token, he said, if you have that kind of context and you play a really quiet note, and especially one which goes up in pitch, in a way, it's like you're giving it more importance, but mm. through the exact opposite, like, mechanism. Or, or, but the effect is, is the same in terms of giving it importance, just, in this case, more beautiful way. Um, yeah. And I find it super useful. Like you've played quite a few of them. Uh, whenever you have like an, an E, uh, E's which sound intense yet not loud, and it's like you achieve the intensity to, to my ears at least. It seems like with a very beautiful color of sound, and also which is made up also with the vibrato. So, like I I, I, I love <laughs> those those notes which kind of sing and shine without you kind of having to force them out of the guitar. And, and that's definitely like something I've, I've heard yeah several times throughout the last hour so. <laughs> oh thanks <laughs> thank you thank you for those uh, but yeah it's, it's a beautiful I think it's a beautiful lesson that a lot of things come not with force but you know and mm. what, what I wanted to mention is that like one thing that strikes me here is the fact that this note has been for, foreshadowed no is that is that the right word like anticipated we've had a yeah. glimpse of this before on the first page right at the end of the first page i don't know if you if you want to play like just the the last bar of the first page um, yeah so you mean the e flat yeah exactly yeah. like when we're in the minor yeah so we have the which you play in a similarly beautiful way but obviously yeah, an e flat similar. doesn't have the same resonances as an e as an e natural and then suddenly we're in kind of the happy the happy bit and uh, yeah no you're is, right exactly it's very similar and and it's very it's i think it's particularly touching because by the time you play this e natural we only have what is it two bars left of the major section before our hearts yeah. are kind of broken uh, again yeah yeah <laughs> yeah exactly exactly i think that like um i don't know the, the well you're right i mean you only have the two bars really two bars three bars i guess um, before it does turn minor, but um, I think those, well, definitely the two bars before we get the next section, hmm. um, they feel a lot more like the introduction to me, like the, hmm. with the expansiveness that you kind of need. I think if you kind of, if you went. <laughs> it just loses all of the, all of the kind of gravitas. Whereas from here, I don't think there's any limit to how long you can keep that. I think like, you know, a minute or so of like pushing it, but you know, <laughs> even still, I think it would sound nice. <laughs> um, so. And I think that is so important because how you play that next D affects how beautiful the E was. So, and also the, the kind of, the very, um, this needs to feel very, the word I'm looking for kind of like nonchalant very kind of uh flippant in a way I think uh, mm. and then you just it's like 
like a huge sigh of relief when you get back to that that D major. And I don't know about you, but this next D, I think, has to like it just needs to feel minor. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It like even of, before you hear the F. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, if, if you played. obviously yeah. we have and we go back to the minor but I think um I don't know when I whenever I play it I always try to we still have quite a warm sound on the and then I ever so slightly it's just a tiny tiny bit harsher mm. um not necessarily pont but just I think maybe just a little bit brighter in tone and it, it kind of I don't know sparks the ear a little bit differently but um And then for the very last time the melody's played, um, I like to put in that slide that I don't do it first, just because I think, um, like I said earlier, you kind of want it to, the, I was speaking about a different section, but it needs to feel a little bit like a closing statement. And I think the more uh, 19th century pieces that I've played, the more it, I find myself doing it, because obviously a lot of the time the theme comes back at the beginning, you have that kind of structure. Um, and I always find myself playing the last the last theme or the last melody the last section um that we've had before i feel like it needs to be a lot more poised it needs to feel like you are coming out with your final closing statement it, it's a little bit different technically it's pretty much exactly the same as what's written before we played it twice but instead of kind of going about it with a sort of a bit movementy a bit kind of flowing where's it going to go I think it just needs to feel a little bit more stagnant, a little bit more poised, a little bit more kind of, I don't know how to describe it. I, I've always I felt that with pieces it. which like start in a minor key and then have a major, mm. like inter major section somewhere in the middle and then go back, revisit like the minor theme. Uh, I always feel yeah. like it's, there's something of a, of a, an emotional defeat of it because in a way you've had a glimpse of, joy happiness relief mm -hmm. uh of carefree <laughs> you know existence only to kind of succumb back again to your your more melancholic you know initial situation which in, in a way okay. makes it doubly uh is that a word doubly <laughs> sad doubly yeah. melancholic like twice as intense so it makes absolute sense for me like you would treat it with I don't know, more resignation, maybe like that's kind of a word that comes to mind uh, from hearing yeah. your, your description of it. Um, and okay. it's so simple, like it's so simple. You can say, oh, it's like just, yeah, something the minor, the major, the minor. It's like almost sounds formulaic, but but no, if you hear it, if you kind of flesh it out and, and you actually experience it, it makes so much sense and it has such an impact. It's incredible, like such a psychological impact. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think the the word that you used was like defeated. Like it kind of feels mm. like it needs to feel defeated, and that that is definitely the word I was looking for earlier. That one hundred percent. That is, I think, what it feels like. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. It definitely needs to have a slightly different tone to it. So as we approach the end of this, I'm just going to write defeated on the score, <laughs> uh, which is <laughs> an optimistic score for you all to look at. Yeah, this is this is a great way to wrap things up, Alex. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, I, but actually I have to take credit for this rather depressing. <laughs> you can sign your name next to it, it's okay. <laughs> like John Dowland, what was it? Um, Semper Dowland, Semper Dolans, like always Dowland, always hurting? Or like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think he signed like that. Anyway. Just write that next to it as well. <laughs> Expressing, yeah. So this is amazing. I think we've covered, we've covered pretty much everything except for the you know that the fact that we're coming back to the minor and we hear mm. a lot of things we've heard before uh just slightly more more compressed right you get like the the main theme from the beginning just that instead of taking up you know a couple of pages or a page and a half it he's kind of compressed it into uh or chosen like just a few sections and mm. i don't know if you want to like maybe walk us through it briefly before taking some questions or um, sure you just the last section you mean or yeah that would yeah be... yeah um is there anything yeah, I mean, noteworthy honest, uh i mean it is 
literally exactly the same, isn't it, as mm. the um, as the beginning? So technically, exactly the same. I think, like we were just talking about before, a little bit more kind of poised. I mean, I don't remember mm. to play it that way now. I was talking about that, but. <laughs> <laughs> balance it because that's not what I did there so you definitely don't want to only be able to hear the uh, octaves but I have no eye fingernail so that's a, a challenge at the moment but and then I like to roll this one so do that one straight and then a little bit of vibrato because you know why not we have done it on everything else <laughs> yeah. of course you can't play um, the three note chord you can only play all the scales you are sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just the way it works. Um, <laughs> no, the one thing to say about the scale is that I think it's nice, like we were talking about earlier, just to, just to end on this note, but it's nice not to go completely overboard with that. I think we can do all the kind of, you know, the fast stuff earlier on when we're kind of building up to something that's within that kind of the same tone as that. And then here, I think speak like with the whole poisonous the whoops sorry is aiming for that tenuto on the you know i don't think it needs to be like crazy is what i'm saying uh because if we go somewhere that we can't get back from then it ends and it feels a little bit like mm -hmm. it's i don't know you need to be prepared for the ending. <laughs> I, I like that. I mean, a lot. One of the things I've kind of rescued from, from you know, all the, the many wonderful things you've, you've talked about today is how something can technically on the page be the same, right? But it doesn't mean you will play it the same. Sometimes, well, I know as a student, I remember I had this kind of obsession with uniformity. Like if something is similar to something else, of course, you should try to make them sound the same, you know, or as similar as you can, if not exactly the same. Uh, mm. Like if you have a gesture in Bach, which is this way, you'll do it exactly the same way when it appears in a different key or whatever. Um, but here it seems to be almost the exact opposite because every time you hear something, it's in a different context, right? You will have, uh, it's, it's like, you know, you use the same word in, in different conversations, they'll have a different effect. Similarly, like yeah. the same passages will have different expressive me meanings quotation like whatever that is uh depending on what has come before what has come after and you have all these wonderful little conversations between, of you know sections talking to each other even even just the last bar like you have the, the harmonics right mm. the, like if you just think of what we started with the first harmonics it's kind of like a plunk plunk like a dominant resolution kind of thing mm. just framing the whole thing and then you have, well, for me, my favorite moments are these fermata, the, the E flat, which is then three pages later in E natural, and then goes back to the E flat, which in itself is kind of a journey, right? The kind of minor, yeah. the major, hopeful, and then again, resignation or defeated, whatever, minor. And and this passage you, you've just mentioned, you know, the um, de -da, de -da, de -da, that one, which came before, which is much more excited. And now it's kind of much more subdued. So, so that's really, in a way, it feels a bit chaotic to to contemplate this if you're learning a piece like thinking, oh, it all needs to be different. Like sometimes you're just <laughs> trying to learn the notes. But I find it really inspiring to know that you know once you get there and you, you want to take it one step further, it's not about making everything sound the same, but trying to find mm. maybe like the unique character of, of each each little section, each little phrase 
when it appears different times. And that's certainly something, you know, I've heard <laughs> and you've explained today, like how a different section can be played in different ways and, and just give us like a different angle. Like, like uh, I think Steve Goss, who was, who also taught us at the World Academy of Music and is a regular guest at Tone Base. So check out his video. Uh, he talks about how in, he likes listening to his music being played by different com uh, performers because it's like, what was the analogy? Uh, not a kaleidoscope, but basically like shining a light like around a different object or looking at it from different angles. Um, yeah. And that's really exciting, exciting to listen to in a performance. So, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for that. No, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. And I think it can, just one thing to say, like I think it can be daunting if you're learning this piece um, and you've got somebody sat here saying, do this, do this, all oh, this is different. Hang on to this one, hang on to this one. And it's like, well, that alters the rhythm, but does it not? But is it the same? Why does it need mm. to be different? And I completely get how overwhelming it can be. Um, but all of this stuff is just is just extra. It's all, it, it is in my opinion, what makes the piece, mm. but obviously all the technique and everything is, is, the, is the groundwork, is the foundation. And then um, yeah. I think, when it gets really fun and really addictive, um, especially is when you can start thinking about how you want it to sound and how your interpretation uh, might mm. be. So, yeah, thank you for allowing me to talk mm. about it. <laughs> oh. I think you're, for viewers, uh, Alex is being only just slight, slightly modest and kind of tempering all the advice she's, she's given. But I think a lot of them are down to like very good I don't know, like interpretation of the score, like things, for example, the first page, the fourth line, like you said, don't accentuate the first note, A, A, right? Like those things, it's, I, it's kind of a dangerous, a dangerous line to uh, kind of path to walk because you don't want to sound like you're, you know, being authoritative and, and saying this is the way to do something, but it's not all up for grabs either. And like certain things like this, uh, I think are a really good, to keep in mind, and, and Francisco Tarrega wrote this, like in his score, for example, don't accentuate the first one, accentuate the second one. I think there are two reasons for that. One is like, whenever you start a phrase, if you give your everything at the beginning, there's nothing to go towards, right? There's no interest. Mm -hmm. And also the guitar is kind of a bit of a plucky instrument, sadly. So whatever we can do to make it sing, and the second note being the longest, like will kind of benefit the music. So. So yeah. I definitely think lots of things you've talked about here today, although, you know, you very kindly say it's just your, your thoughts. I think there's a lot there which can be used for many other pieces. You know, some people might not be playing Capichara, they might be playing other things, but hopefully some of the things you've shared with us today might kind of rub off and inspire, you know, inspire <laughs> everyone in, in different pieces. So. I'm conscious of, of time. You've been very generous uh, already. And I know that you're leaving for a rather long and intense tour in only a day or two. So it's, it's pretty amazing that you're here with us anyway. So <laughs> thank you for that. But if, if it's okay with you, maybe we could wrap up with a few minutes of questions if anyone has. Of course. Them. Yeah. yeah. Put my amazing. Guitar now. So let's have a look. Uh, questions. Yeah, we have a few. So let's see what Barney has to say. He asks, for the scale run, when do you change strings and how to keep the crescendo and accelerando flowing on legato? That was asked towards the beginning of the stream. So I'm gonna guess he's referring, Barney's referring to the scale on the third line. So. Uh, okay, yeah. So the first part of that question was what, sorry, that was um, where do you oh. change strings? Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, so there are, yeah, there are a couple of different ways of doing this as there are with everything, <laughs> which makes things a lot more complicated, but. Um, so it's all fourth string, or at least the way I do it is all fourth string um, until. I'm in seventh seventh position. <laughs> Stay in seventh position, and then use the open D to shift down to first position. So, oops. and then obviously you have the slide. Um, gotcha. 
yeah hopefully that answers your question was there another part to that question sorry um and how to keep the crescendo and accelerando flowing and legato hmm yes good question i think we um, touched upon this <laughs> briefly but maybe you can just remind us yeah i think the, with the legato i think leaning on the notes that we talked about at first i think that mm. does help because if you have to play it all very very i mean if we were doing it in a very metronomic way um it would be less flowing you'd be kind of i mean less phrasing um and it's quite a long run to phrase so if, if it were all one very very long run without any kind of phrasing i think it would feel very lost um so yeah i think leaning on the first of each group um of one of those so obviously the I think is where the accelerando is also not only easier but also like that's where it needs to happen so it just feels a little bit more doable I think when you kind of shift down and also you've got the open string to help with that there. Um, so yeah and obviously I am I am all the way uh, unless you can do some fancy thumb work <laughs> which I'm not sure would be even possible there, but maybe <laughs> All right, thank you. So another question is, are there certain parts where damping, muting strings is important? Uh, yes, although I fear it will probably take a couple of hours to go through where all of those are. <laughs> um, definitely, I think, um, Obviously, if we're being exact, then you want to be dampening it there um, mm -hmm. in the, when you have the melody, because we have the bass line of... And obviously there, so mainly, I think, whenever you get the 5-1 cadence with, between the mm -hmm. A and the D, you don't want... You don't want the A ringing over to that. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, it's, the A is within the chord, but at the same time, if we have that, that low A ringing over, it's going to sound very muffled at the bottom, so... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, basically, whenever you, well, the, the main, the main uh, part, because this happens a lot, because we have the repeated bass line, uh, the main place that you want to be blocking the basses is, is definitely uh, every time, well, it's pretty much between every bar, really. I mean, that, that mm -hmm. happens pretty much every bar within the melody. So every time you have the open A goes to the open D, just make sure that when you play the open D, uh, that goes straight down to block the open A, because then it will sound much cleaner. So is it uh, a rest stroke which immediately stops the A or is it a free stroke which then gently rests on the A? Uh, I do free strokes, so I, I don't know, hopefully you can see, but um, choose a... Uh... Yeah. So it just hops down very... Uh... I do actually tend to separate some of those, so it yeah. is a bit of a cheat, but... <laughs> It makes it so that you have a little bit more time uh, mm -hmm. to block the bass. But yeah, I think that's probably the most important part to block on. Amazing. Okay, one more question. Um, well, it will be two left, but this is penultimate. How do we make the piece sound polished like a concert artist and not like a student? <laughs> Give us a secret, uh, Alex. That's the, that's the question we, we all have. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like if I possessed the answer to that question, I wouldn't have needed to go to music college. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know if I have the answer to that question, but I hope that there have been a lot of helpful indicators to how that question might at some point be answered. Um, I think it, well, well you, you kind of touched upon something like this earlier, Manny, which was um, that you have to kind of put in so much work and so much time and so there's so many intricacies that you have to, um, that you have to go into in order for it to sound easy in order for it mm. to sound effortless because that's at the end of the day if you hear you know your favorite guitarist playing a lot of the time it just sounds like you know they woke up two minutes ago and just it's just happening and it's just great and and i mean rarely is that the case but i think um it's important to look at the piece as a whole once you've done all of the groundwork all of the hard work so you know you have to make sure that your technique is is up to scratch to be able to play a certain standard of piece 
um, you know, if it isn't, then maybe take certain aspects out of that piece, out of context, and then use them to improve the technique that you might be struggling with. Um, there are lots and lots of different ways that you can use pieces like this uh, that have so many different techniques uh, used in them. You know, you have the harmonic, you have so many slurs, you have a lot of uh, kind of melody accompaniment textures that where you can you can experiment with doing rest stroke on certain notes of the melody to make things stand out. There's there are endless different things that are all compiled into one one relatively short piece, um, mm. and I think it's important to kind of not overlook any of those but at the same time there are hundreds of them <laughs> so it, I think I think um it it kind of relies on that feeling of when you've you've got the groundwork of a piece and you've got the fingering down you've got all the notes and you feel like it might be lacking something and I think that feeling and I certainly have that feeling from time to time of when I'm playing through pieces and I know that it's lacking something like sometimes difficult to put your finger on what but when you find what it is and you experiment with it, you listen to lots of different recordings of it by different people um, and you get as much kind of knowledge about it as possible and just carry on playing it. I think then it, it you know, you're doing all you can to find what it's missing. Um, mm. And I think that is definitely when it begins to feel more polished. Um, yeah. Long winded answer to a very good question. But <laughs> I like that. It sounds like there's no definite end to the process it's uh it's very much like an open-ended kind of journey <laughs> <put> people off <laughs> <laughs> so is... it is but i think that's nice i think that's that goes back to what i said earlier about the fact that i recorded this piece on youtube about six six or seven years ago mm. and i look back at it now and i wouldn't play it like that now yeah. and i don't like listening back to it now so i'm like oh god that's not like a representation of me as a musician now but that's why people re-record the same programs you know within 10 years of each other because your interpretation changes and you grow as a musician so you know the last thing I'm saying is that oh it's just difficult and you have to put up with it it's never gonna get there it's always work when in fact you know it it's just you changing as a as a mm. musician your tastes change and the things that you like change so you know that's definitely a good thing I think <laughs> yeah it's it's always I, I remember when I was a student and if you watch like as you say, one of your favorite guitarists, and you think, wow, like what they're doing is amazing. Um, I remember seeing one such guitarist and after the concert, I could see he was rather unhappy with his playing, uh, which always strikes me very weird. It's like, how, how could you be unhappy if you played so amazingly well? But it's like somehow, like in the mind of a musician, there's something which kind of, well, I don't know. I, I guess you could find complacent musicians, but, um, I don't seem to have come across like any really, <laughs> really good complacent musician. Like it, they might be self-assured and say, well, yeah, that was like the best I could do today. And mm -hmm. I feel happy with that. There's nothing wrong with being comfortable and proud about your achievements. But most people who I find are remarkable have that kind of openness to say, well, yeah, things change. Um, I might be able to do a bit more, <laughs> you know, next time given yeah. the chance and and that's really really inspiring and you say you might you know disagree with your own performances your own performance of Capricharave uh, and yet there are a few million people on YouTube who disagree with you so <laughs> <laughs> so it's um, yeah I don't know it's an encouraging thought I find um, maybe maybe <laughs> this is kind of a nice place to uh, to wrap it up wrap it up I just want to like ask you Alex what, what what are your plans what are what are you doing I can see like I'm, I'm searching you on Google, I find your website and I see you're playing all these concerts. Like if anyone watching is in Europe, there's a chance that Alex <laughs> might be playing near you. So uh, do check yeah. out her website uh, for the concerts, if not for the concerts, for the videos or for the, for the music. But can you just like give us a little glimpse into what your life will be over the next, oh, I don't know, two weeks or a month? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going on tour for almost six weeks on Wednesday. Um, <laughs> So yeah, like you said, if you're in Europe, <laughs> maybe see that um, we start in, uh, so it's, it's myself and then three other fantastic guitarists um, of all different genres. We're playing some solo stuff, loads of things together. Um, and it's just gonna be a load of fun and I can't wait. Um, we start off in the Netherlands and then I think we have three dates in the Netherlands and then we have maybe about 20 dates throughout uh, Germany. And then we wow. end uh, with a couple in Austria. 
so yeah it's going to be a hectic and busy uh five weeks but yeah if you're in germany then there is a chance that i might be playing near you so uh hopefully see you there um and yeah i'm looking forward to it i still need to pack <laughs> <laughs> i'm going on wednesday and haven't started packing so that's something that i'm definitely gonna start that's, tonight. That's plenty fun. Gl <laughs> glad to hear you won't be alone on the road so <laughs> yes me too <laughs> do you get to bring your cat I don't know. Sadie has to stay here. And also, I don't know where she is. She usually makes an appearance on like, every live stream that I do, but uh, she hasn't knocked over any cameras or any equipment. So that's a positive because she definitely has before. <laughs> well, it sounds like we'll have to have Sadie on next time. So yes. maybe, maybe you can join yeah, her too. Yeah. <laughs> is, where's Luna? Is Luna not there? She's usually sleeping behind you. Luna is in the, the, the room. Uh, yeah, next door. Again, next yeah, next time we'll we'll unite them and we'll just yeah. kind of be in the the backdrop. Uh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Sounds so, good. Alex, thank you so much for your time. I uh, appreciate you saying we overran a little bit. Uh, those who no you know, yeah, thank you come for to my me. live streams know that I always overrun. It's a, a flaw of mine. <laughs> so, thank you for bearing with us, and thank you mostly for sharing your insights, your musicianship, uh, and your love for guitar. So. All best wishes. I'm sure all the viewers will join me in you know, wishing you a very happy tour and Thank much you. success. Hope to see you again very, very soon. You too. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye.